but uh, let Welcome. me open with prayer and then we'll, yes. um, we'll give you the floor for you to highlight pieces of your testimony. So um, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your miraculous hand. Uh, thank you for the testimony that you have written with Gene's life. Thank you for his willingness to share what you have done so widely in this world, because we know that through his story and his experience and his powerful wisdom about forgiveness and freedom, others will see you differently. And maybe even for the first time, we thank you for those who testified to him. And now he testifies to us and what a pleasure and a joy it is for us to listen to him brag about your work in his life. We rejoice already for this opportunity and pray God that you will give us what each one needs to hear in the way we need to hear it. Thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, Jean, uh, why don't you just remind us who you okay. are and how yeah. you got here? Well, um, Welcome. Um, I, I feel welcome with Hopewell um, United Methodist Church and all the congregants and with Amy and Jen. I, I, <laughs> I'm from Pennsylvania originally, and I was uh, went out with an older cousin, an old stepbrother to go drinking one night just to have some fun and shoot some pool. In about 20 minutes, my cousin decided to rob the bar. So we decided to leave and if he was going to do it himself. Of course, we left, and a few minutes later, we returned to see what was the holdup, and he had murdered the owner. And so we took off. I knew I, I knew I was wrong. I knew something. I, I obviously I was drunk. We were all drunk, but I knew what went on, and I knew there was there was I was in trouble. So obviously, I fled with my my uh, cousin. Went to New York City a day, walking the streets, not knowing what to do. Turned myself in. And I was arrested and charged. My cousin, of course, he turned himself in about 10 days later and took the case. But I was arrested and charged with murder and a, a number of other crimes. And I was placed in the center. I was given an attorney and the attorney recommended that I plead guilty to murder. I could be out in 10 years, which I did. Uh, nine months later, I was sentenced to life without parole and sentenced uh, to the state correctional institution in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. I was, um, I was, I'll stop there and just say, I am the product of two great investments, one greater than the other. Um, Jesus died for me and shed his blood on the cross. He was buried, he rose again for me. He died because he felt my life was worth his as, as yours, as yours. And I was also, um, part of a, uh, uh, the sacrifice um, of a man who came up to me in the prison system. He was a pastor from the outside. He came up to me and he challenged me if I knew Jesus Christ and if I had made a commitment to Christ. And I just felt it was a sacrifice of his time and effort and energy to be in that prison system where I got to meet him. And he, he asked me if I had made a commitment. I didn't, but that weekend I did. And it really changed my life, which um, I ended up contacting the pastor, told him what I, I, that I made a commitment that, that weekend, and I accepted the Lord. I was born again. I was saved. And after 10 years of incarceration, of, of dealing and wheeling and using drugs, meth, uh, pills, um, I was born again. And my life had changed radically in, in so many ways. And I just began a, a discipleship um, lifestyle. And whatever I would, whatever I would read, whatever I learn, I would want to pass it on to others. And I realized Jesus has one plan for our lives, and that's discipleship. And it led throughout the years. Twenty-five years later, I was um, released um, a miracle. Uh, they realized I had been sentenced illegally, and I had an unconstitutional sentence. I was released on uh, in like it was 30, 34 years, nine months, fifteen days later, and. Uh, I realized I did not waste a single day and, and God never wasted a day of, of, of his time on me while I was incarcerated. Very powerful testimony. And uh, when we, when, uh, when we spoke before, uh, we, we talked a lot about the theme of forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, that being a major theme, how you experience that through Christ. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about forgiveness, how you yourself received it and how you were able to experience it with Bobby, with your attorney, with your dad. What does that mean for you? I was, um, I, I, I guess I experienced forgiveness before I really understood it. You know, we all understand forgiveness at some level. You know, I'm sorry, you all. Okay. Um, I had a real issue growing up because whenever I said I was sorry to my mother, she would kind of snap at me. You know, you better be. So I was always afraid to say I was sorry. So, but I remember saying I was sorry to God for my sins that night. And I knew that something happened. I didn't quite understand everything I knew. I look back now, I knew I was born again. I knew uh, I, I was introduced to Jesus Christ. And when I went back, I started reading the Bible. I realized that God loved me and God forgave me. Those two things stood out uh, in everywhere I read in the Bible for the next couple of days. Um, I realized I had made a, uh, some, I had offended a lot of people. And, you, and when you deal with the drugs and the money and stuff like that, you, you'll, you'll cause some enemies. And I realized I had to go apologize. I remember apologize, said, God, forgive me for hurting Danny. And he says, yes, but I'm not Danny. Go apologize to Danny. I was like, oh, is that how it works? <laughs> so there was a lesson of humility of getting up out of my cell, going to Danny's cell and say, hey, Danny, I'm sorry for hurting you. I'm, I'm wrong. Would you forgive me? And he forgave me. So I was experiencing forgiveness um, probably before I really understood it. And um, then knowing that God through Christ forgives us and it's, 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 a, it's a result of loving us so much that he's willing to forgive us. And I knew that I had the forgiveness of God in my heart. And because I knew he forgave me, there was nothing too hard for me to forgive. And I may struggle through it, but because God forgave me, I was to forgive others. And it was the, it was the, the foundation knowing that God forgave me, I'll forgive other people. Yeah, and in, and in some ways, uh, maybe one of your first steps towards freedom, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I, you know, I've realized uh, freedom is having the ability to do what is right, you know, in this sense, uh, to do what God wants you to do. You know, before I knew the Lord, before he forgave me, uh, in a sense of accepting that, I, I just didn't understand uh, the power to forgive. I, I didn't want to. Uh, but um, being born again, I, I realized the Holy Spirit has given me the power to do what is right. Um, the word gives us the instruction to do it. And the Holy, Holy Spirit helps us in, uh, in a tremendous way. And freedom is the ability for me is to do what is right, especially when everything's going wrong. So. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's a that's an interesting definition for us to contemplate with you, right? Because sometimes we... Uh, we might define freedom differently, but d just tell us a little bit more about that definition. What do you mean when you say the, the freedom to do what is right? I, yeah, I think there's, there's some really hard characters uh, in the prison system and, and they don't have any problem offending you or hurting you. And, and there's, there's a level of uh, uh, forgiveness that you, I want to extend. So I don't hold grudges. I don't hold uh, animosity toward them and having the ability to forgive others when they're not even changed. Much like, you know, Christ loved us while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So God in, in his economy, he, he forgave us even while we were yet sinners, but I know there's, there's a reconciliation that happens. And so for me, um, I was willing, because of the Lord, I was willing to forgive and release them from holding a grudge or holding a penalty over their lives. And same with Bobby, you know, um, I forgave Bobby for leading me astray or not looking out for me as my older cousin. I, I made my, I made some decisions. I made some bad, bad choices and bad decisions, but I was also, um, I, I needed to say, Hey, Bobby, I, I forgive you. Whether he accepted or not, I said it in prayer, you know, Bobby, I forgive you. I release you from any penalty. You don't owe me anything. And the same with my father, you know, my father was, he abandoned, he abdicated his responsibility as, as a six-year-old, he, he left the house. And, and so I, I was able to say, you know, Heavenly Father, as you forgave me, I want to forgive my dad. And I stopped holding a penalty to extract a penalty from him. He doesn't owe me anything, you know? And so it really did set me free, the attorney, the judge, and all those things that, that I, I felt um, 
where I might have been, I might have been done wrong. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, I think that uh, that gives us a lot to think about, as I said, how are we defining freedom? Yeah. Um, and, and I think in some ways our definition of it um, can expand so that we can have the fullness of it. That, that was a real journey for you over the course of your nearly 35 years in prison. And when I was reading your book, Unshackled, which I think a lot of people on the call are reading, and we're going to be putting together some um, discussion groups for folks so that we can really digest uh, with a little more detail some of the yeah. themes that you draw forth. But you go through this process. In the beginning, you talk about being remorseful. I, I wish I hadn't done that to being repentant, right? So what is the difference from your point of view between remorse and repentance? Uh, the, the remorse part, I, it was the emotional part, I would say. Um, you know, I, I felt bad. I felt bad because of the consequences of being in prison, of being in juvenile center. You know, I, I knew I did wrong. I, you know, um, and I, I couldn't apologize to the victim. The victim was deceased. So I, I started writing letters to my high school friends, to my family, and I even wrote, I wrote the judge, I wrote anybody I could uh, and said, hey, I'm sorry. And, but, you know, I was really, it, it, was, it was good, God used that, but the real person I needed to say I was sorry to was the Lord. So, uh, yes, I, I felt this remorse, but the, the fact that once I said it to God, I learned about repentance. So repentance was, uh, so when I was remorse, I was still, I was still a sinner. I was, I was still rebellious. I was still going through stuff. But once I repented, that was the behavior. And I started to change my behavior because of the word of God, because of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he lay, the you know, Holy Spirit led me to the word. The Lord, the word taught me how to live, how to act, how to treat people in love and not to continue a lifestyle of hurt and wounding people. So the remorse part was an emotional part. And, you know, we all feel that, but not everybody will repent. Mm -hmm. Godly repentance leads to freedom. Yeah, amen. And I think God gave you uh, many, God spoke through many different people to, yeah. to uh, present a different example of what life in Christ would look like. Pastor Larry, one of those people. And yeah. you talk in the book a lot about what it meant for you to learn from him humility and having a servant's heart. So can you teach us a little bit about that? What did you learn from him and how has that shaped who you are now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, it started, I think it started one day I came out to uh, the visiting room and Larry came to visit me and I just kept like, hey man, this is going wrong. This is going bad. This is not happening. This, and he, sir, he says, well, servant has no rights. And it kind of hit me home, you know, and I've been reading about, you know, this is the Apostle Paul, servant of the Lord, servant of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so when he, he would say that, and he, he probably said it a few times to me, you know, what rights does a servant have? You're a servant of the Lord. You don't have the right. So I went back and I, so I, I, I said, I want to find out, you know, I want to know myself. So I, I got into Philippians chapter two, you know, it says that Jesus was, Jesus was God. And he said, he didn't consider equality God, somebody grasped, but made, made himself nothing took on the nature of a servant. So I was like, I want to be like Jesus. You know, I want to be like Jesus. I want to act like Jesus. And so I look up the word servant and I'm like, I don't think I want to be like Jesus. Not this part, you know, and I, you know, this whole thing about being a servant and um, a servant has no rights, has no entitlement mentality, you know? And so I started saying, okay, my, if, if I don't have a mentality of entitlement, there's nothing I can get mad about. And so that was, there was a really, um, a really big, big revelation for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, being a servant um, forgives everybody, you know, and considers others better than themselves. And so I, I had the attitude that everybody else is more important than me. I'm not saying I got it right all the time and I did it all the time, but that was the attitude. And I was, I said, I have no right. So I didn't have a right to clean sheets, hot food. Um, I didn't have a right to visits. I didn't have a right to phone calls. You know, these things are provided and a privilege to the, you know, in the system. But, you know, even in a prison, you can become entitled. Hey, you know, I, 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 I need two sets of sheets or I need two pillows or, you know, I, I had hot food yesterday and the food's not up to par today. So, you know, as a servant, we have no rights and a servant considers others better than themselves. 
And that led me to walk in such an, a new anointing, a new ministry. And I saw everybody different. I saw everybody as, you know, precious to the Lord and precious through my eyes because of that, the attitude of, of having a servant. And so there was oftentimes Larry would say, Hey, you know, Hey, what rights does a servant have? I'm like, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are times even now when you can hear his voice oh, telling that, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Like when I'm driving down the highway and these and people are not using their blinkers, you know, and I'm like, use your blinker, man. And I, and I can feel like, I can feel my stress, you know, and I, and it reminds me, Gene, you don't have a right for them to, you know, why are you getting mad? You, you think you have a right for them to drive in a certain way. And it can be really catchy, you know, and it's, it's, it's not to, uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but it, it'll catch you, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, go down. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, that position of what does, what does it mean for us? And, and Paul talks about that all the time. I'm a bond servant and bond servants are people who willingly put themselves into servitude, right? It's a choice that we freely make because of, of how compelling his, uh, his character and his, uh, his sacrifice is to us, right? And I, and I think that we are meant to live counterculturally as followers of Jesus yeah. in yeah. a world that really struggles with entitlement, right? For right. us to be different than the mass. So yeah. um, it's interesting that you bring that up because I remember you also saying something connecting entitlement and anger where you say entitlement is one of the origins of anger. When you feel entitled, you get angry angry when those kinds of things don't happen for you. And you say the other place comes from unhealed hurts, right? Wound, yeah, so, wound, woundedness. Yeah. So tell us about how those two things um, are for, for you, that revelation about these two places that need to be attended to so that you're not living such an, with, with such an angry spirit. Yeah. I, um, at some point in time, you know, you start spending time in the word, you get quiet enough that the Lord can speak to you. And, uh, you know, the idea of being a servant um, and, and I, the whole issue about getting mad or getting angry when you don't get your way. And I, I thought, well, where's it come from? You know, the Bible says, be angry, sin not. And I've yet to do that, you know? So it was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, uh, so it's like, okay, where does anger come from? And, and I, right away, right away, it was like, past wounds you know people have hurt you because you know i've gotten into conversations with people and i've, I've i'm like are, you know we're talking about somebody and i mention a name and you can see them like you know like cats on the cat scratch it's like oh they they are they are offended or they're wounded or they're hurt so they get mad and so i, I just started thinking you know who am i mad at who who, who do i feel offended you know and so i started forgiving people I, you know, I literally went through a teacher, uh, you know, a teacher that smacked me and um, assaulted me in class. I was, I was, I was rude. I was class, class but it, it, it brought a lot of wounds, you know? So I started forgiving everybody that I felt hurt me and I've just released them again, the forgiveness of God for my life. I'm going to extend that to them in the same manner. And then also, um, you know, what rights, you know, what entitlements do I have? And if, you know, if I got something, I wanted to praise God for it. And if I didn't, I want to be able to praise God for it too. Um, obviously I was, I was well fed and I had a roof on my head and all those things. But like I said, in prison, you can become very entitled with an attitude like that. So I just got rid of all the entitlement mentality. And I said, you know, anything I have is a gift from God. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I can't demand anything, you know? Yeah. And in some ways that, uh, that perspective of entitlement is itself a prison, right? I mean, oh, uh, big time. Yeah. I, you know, I work in a restaurant, I'm a chaplain for a restaurant and we have 15, 1800 employees or so. And, you know, the, the girls are called servers, you know, uh, politically, I guess not waitress, but servers. And they, you know, these high school girls, college girls, and they work hard, you know, and we have a standard in our restaurant in, in time-wise and service, and they do work hard. Um, they've spoiled me. Every restaurant I've gone to, they, I'm, I'm spoiled because of their, their way. But they'll come back and they'll say, my table left me $3. 
And I know it's hard. I know I, you know, and I got to be careful about, you know, oh, don't worry about it. The next one, you know, but there, I can use those examples, you know, about being entitled, you know, you're, you're here for all, you're here all day, you know, so somebody gave you $50, but somebody gave you $30, you know, in perspective. So you're, you're focusing on this one issue and it's going to eat you up. And I, and, and sometimes it does eat them up and it ruins their whole day because yeah. somebody kept in $3 instead of the, the normal, you know? So I, I get to use that teaching a lot in the restaurant. Yeah, I think one of the most compelling examples of that that you share both in your testimony with us last weekend and in your book is uh, the, the countless times uh, where you went back to yourself um, and prayed and thanked God, right? I mean, what, yeah. what was that experience like for you? What, what, what does that sound like in prayer form? Um, I would, I had, I was using the second Thessalonians 5, 18, you know, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And again, you know, I want to do God's will. That was my prayer every day. God, I want to do your will and God, I want to be like Jesus. And, you know, it, it, it expanded, but that was like the gist of my prayer life. And um, so when I got denied, it hurt. There's, there's no question that there's emotions involved, rejection. You have to deal with that. And I, you know, I kept in mind, okay, they rejected me. God didn't reject me. Mm -hmm. And so that allowed me to go back to my cell. And I would, I would, sometimes I'd struggle. I try to mentally figure out what to say, how to say it. And instead of just um, getting on my knees for me, that was important for me. I didn't, you know, I don't think anybody has to pray on their knees, but for me, it was just a, a kind of a mark of, Hey God, I, I'm, I surrender, you know, I, I don't have a fight in this. You do. And I would literally open my mouth and say, God, thank you for denying me because I know your will is better than mine. You know, I, I, I would literally just be pray like that. And, um, I would say, God, you know, I thank you that you put all the people in my life. You, you, you gave me a resume. That's unbelievable. The institution supported me, but the board of pardons reject, you know, they, they denied me mm -hmm. Like God, I'm, I'm doing your will. And I, if I do your will here, then, you know, I, I have reason to praise you and worship you. And I would work through that. It may take a couple of days. Um, I'd have to make phone calls and, you know, call my mom, call my sister. And they're like, okay, well, when's the next time can you file? You know, and I'm eligible for two years. And so for the next two years, so um, there's, there's the emotion part. And then uh, prayer overcomes the emotional part um, for me. And of course, being in the word every day, um, in doing God's will, that was the most important thing. Yeah, Again, I, mean, I was going to say, let me, uh, that I didn't have a right to freedom in, in, mm -hmm. as far as being released. Mm -hmm. And if that came, that was a blessing. That was, that was uh, a miracle from God. Um, but I never felt like God, they owe me. And I think that really helped me early on. Yeah. And, and in some ways our, the expression of prayer to God doesn't necessarily reflect where we are in the moment, but where we want to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right? And I definitely, you know, sometimes it was tears, sometimes it was teeth gritting, you know, yeah. it's like, uh, my mind was racing. Uh, and sometimes it took me to just read the Bible, um, just spend time in a word and, and meditate on scriptures, meaning, you know, read it five times, try to memorize that word, try to memorize that word. And it, 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 it kept me out of a, a depression it kept me out of a woe is me yeah. um, and it kept me from being angry or you know it, so those things uh being in a word and meditating and praying was was so essential yeah definitely a source of strength yeah um oh. i have one more question that i want to ask you before i open it up to everyone else um having been incarcerated for 35, oh, nearly 35 years, it was what, 34 years, nine months and 15 days. Did I get it? Yes. Okay. Um, you know something about waiting. And so here we are in this uh, global pandemic since COVID hit, uh, we have been in a season of waiting. And I just want to give you space uh, to share with us, what kind of wisdom and encouragement do you have for those of us who are struggling to wait? <laughs> I, I, yeah. Hey, I was, I was, yeah, yeah. It, you know, um, 
I, I struggled, you know, I'm like, what, what, what's going on here? What's my, my life is changing. I, I, I don't, can't do what I used to do and, you know, and how I do it. Uh, it all entailed change. Um, I would never have dreamed that we would be in October still dealing with this. I, you know, my mindset was a month, but I heard other people around me saying, it's going to go into the summer. I said, for real, are you serious? So I, I, um, I guess I learned along the way, uh, but when when uh, when I was writing the book, I remember writing the book, and and people were asking me, "Oh, you must finish? You almost done? Where's it at?" You know, and friends would call me, and they, how's it coming along? And I I always always say, "Well, we're on track. We're on track." And as we got into like the you know fifteen month period, it took twenty months. We were about fifteen months. I was like, "Man, I don't know, man. It's it's taking forever, and the delays and." This person's not doing his job. And so, you know, and my friend said, oh, hold on. We we're on the phone. He said, oh, hold up. He said, let me, let me get this right. You spent 34 years, nine months, 15 days to get out of jail, get out of prison. And now you're stressing over nine months or 10 months. I said, hold on. <laughs> let me get on the phone. And I said, I got to repent, you know. Um, I think uh, what I learned through it all is that God is as much in the process as he is in the destination. And so for me, um, obviously, I didn't know where the destination was going through the prison system. Uh, maybe it was a month, maybe it was to get to the summer, summer to summer, a visit to a visit. And I just felt like, God, you're involved in the process as much as the destination. So once I got out, I realized even more so how God was in the process of building character, of connecting me to people, because if I had rushed through any bit of that, you know, as much as I wanted to, if I had rushed through, I would have missed some of the greatest blessings of people and relationships and provision that came, yeah. you know, uh, even, even the, the man who um, welcomed me to Texas and gave me a check for $10,000. The first day I met him, he said, welcome to Texas, go buy yourself a car. And I remember I cried and he was crying. And I said, Monty, I said, about three or four years ago, I was praying for a car and I saw a hand with keys, like a silhouette. And I, and I knew God was going to answer that prayer and you're the answer to that prayer. So had I gone through the day too fast or missed something or did not. So I, God, God, if you, if you would just live in the now and um, enjoy his presence, um, being patient is not so difficult. It's not yeah. so difficult. But he definitely, he's definitely in the process. Uh, we all want to get to heaven, but we don't want to take the journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, I, I think that's, uh, it's really encouraging, right? I mean, we've been in this, we've been at this now uh, for the better part of a year. And um, it isn't always easy to find God in the process uh, and in the day to day. But your encouragement for us to be looking for blessings and to be connecting uh, God's work all around us so that we don't miss those blessings is a beautiful gift to us tonight. I, yeah, unbelievable. I, you know, throughout this whole, um, this experience, I, you know, I pray every morning. I say, God, I pray for divine appointments and divine opportunities. And I mean, that's like every day I'm like looking for opportunities um, to, to be a witness, to help, you know, to lend somebody, you know, a, a hand, whether it's some money or some food or, you know, or a conversation uh, or to be a witness. And so um, throughout this, I think if we make Christ the center of our life in the midst of the turmoil and the midst of all the politics and, and the changing world and the masks and all that, uh, we, we'll think less of that and we'll think more of what God has planned for our life. And, and that, it applies for me because I've, I've gotten off center. Uh, I've gotten worried about what's going on. I've, I've stressed over things. I, I've spoken about things that I, I shouldn't have spoken about, you know, it's just uh, spoke too soon. And so I think for me, if, if I can keep my eyes on the Lord and focus on him and what he has with me here, um, it, it is, it is amazing to see what God will do. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to turn the, the focus, uh, to those that are logged on to see if you have questions for Gene that you'd like him to answer. Jen, do you have any already in the chat? Okay, great. 
So the first question, Jean, is going back to um, what you were sharing about forgiveness, that you had gone from cell to cell at some point asking folks to forgive you um, and even writing letters and making phone calls. So the question is related to reaction from people. How did, um, how did people react to you saying, I'm born again, I found Christ, um, I'm asking you to forgive me? Did, did you get any poor reactions to that? I did not. I didn't receive any poor reactions. I got some weird looks uh, from, <laughs> from a lot of friends that they knew me. They knew my lifestyle. You know, I, I was hustling and wheeling and dealing. I was going 100 miles an hour in one direction. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm walking around with a Bible in my hand. I'm going to Bible study. And I know people talk, you know, and people are, uh, you know, looking. And um, I'm going to church on Sunday. But when I went, it, it, it was harder. I think it was harder for me to say, hey, I'm sorry, uh, than it was for the person to receive it. God's grace, uh, I think, was already active. And I was willing to, you know, I was, I, was, I was prepared for rejection. I was prepared for someone to say, hey, get out of here. You're a jerk, you know, and, and it never happened. And I thought, you know, God's grace made a way. Um, and it was, they, were, they were really receptive to that. Um, and, I, you know, here it is. God's all about relationships and, and to be a Christian and have all these people, you know, wondering what's on your mind and, or they're hurt by you. So it, it was necessary for me to reconcile with, with as many people as I could. That's amazing. Thank you. Yep. Um, next question is related to your ministry in prison. What was that like? Uh, like a day to day, um, what did that look like after you had um, started discipleship? Oh, I realized that um, I think the plan is that you be, you be a disciple uh, and then you disciple others and then you release them in their calling. So for me, I, I, you know, I, I said yes with Larry and another couple pastors that I got to visit with. And, I, and it was some really strong, strong brothers that were in the prison system already. And so I just kind of latched onto them early on and, and learned from them. And, um, so once, once I felt like God was using me to disciple others, you know, and I was like, I would, I was like missing it because God says, Hey, don't worry about that guy over there. The guy that's following you around every day, you know, the guy that's, that's, that's latched onto you, you know, I throw today, you know, be a witness to him, disciple him. And I was like, oh, okay, that's how it works. So, um, you know, I would always, you know, pray, read, get read up, prayed up. Um, I'd be praying for the people that were in my life. And I noticed that when I did not pray, it was difficult. When I prayed, it was easy. And because I believe the anointing of the Holy Spirit prepares. Um, and it's, it's easy to, it's really easy to learn who you can disciple and who you can't. And it's about who's teachable who's correctable, who's willing to listen. And I, and there was enough men around me that were like Orlando. I wrote about Orlando and, and, and wrote about Will and, and Warner. Warner was a, both, Will, Warner was a good uh, person for me uh, to, to help me out. And then later on, I was able to help him out and things. So, uh, you know, who, who's, who's around you, who's teachable, who's correctable. And I just kind of kept that in my mind. Um, and just throughout, throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year, uh, you might spend a couple of days with somebody and I might spend, you know, three, four five years. I might spend our whole sentence together. And it was just about preparing people. So just jumping off of that, do you still visit or talk with, um, the, some of the folks that you just mentioned, Warner and Will, um, do you, do you visit and are you still in relationship with them? Um, no, I haven't. Been, I'm not allowed to visit them. Uh, I haven't been allowed to go back uh, into the prison I was at. So Warner, I have not seen Warner. I have not seen uh, a, a lot of guys, but Will, uh, who, AK Surf, he's, he's at SCI Phoenix in Collegeville area. And I've gone into Phoenix and spoken twice uh, into their ministry. I've done that twice. I've got to see Will twice, um, but they have access to my phone. They, they call me, Warner calls me each week. 
um, and Scott Warner, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, an inmate in uh, Chester, uh, he's a lifer, and then there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a young, younger, um, he was young when I was in prison, he was a younger guy, Jose, he's at Camp Hill now, and they're lifers that I, I support them financially, I send them money every month, write letters and uh, phone calls, um, and they, we, we keep in close touch. Yep. Awesome. That's kind of the that's kind of the extent of my prison ministry. Um, I don't have a real passion to do prison ministry, but those guys, I'm I'm totally committed to them ever since I've been released. That's awesome. Um, do you did you have any boyhood male mentors like coaches or neighbors? Uh, you mentioned that your dad um, left when you were young. Did you have some of those role models? Yeah. Uh, my stepfather, um, from the age of, I think, 13, he remarried my mom. He was a Christian man. And uh, he, the, the things I remember, of course, I was so out of control, even as a young kid, uh, doing what I wanted to do. Uh, but my, I remember my, my stepdad, would he'd always be on the side of his bed reading the Bible in the morning. He was, uh, we lived on a dairy farm, and he took care of the dairy farm. And uh, so he was an influence uh, in my life. Uh, when it came when it came to work, he he taught me a work ethic, and uh, he would ask me to come help him, and I would be like, "Well, I want to go out with my friends." He said, "He said, okay, I'll, I'll do it myself." I'm like, "No, I'll help you." So he, you know, he he had a way of in, you know encouraging me to be a work ethic. I, my football coach Augie Grant, uh, for a couple years, for two years playing football, he he was a real class act. He was a um, as much as I was around him, I respected him. Um, I still had, a, I still had issues with rebellion and authority and they really came out once I got into the prison system. Uh, and it really, thank God for Jesus. <laughs> Cause I, I was, I need, I needed a savior for real. Um, I was a very rebellious person. And if, if I liked you, I respect you, but if I didn't like you, I wouldn't listen to you. So there were a few, there was a doctor, Dr. Hoffman. He was a, he was a physician at the Camp Hill prison. And I, I worked as an orderly for four years. And I remember him sitting down a few times talking to me. Uh, I wasn't a Christian, but he just, he just, he just said, you know, uh, life's tough and you got to make some choices and decisions and you got to be responsible. So those things, uh, I look back, um, I think they affected me, but they didn't change my core like Christ changed my core. Mm -hmm. So then once you were um, in the prison system, were there other inmates who inspired you or provided a source of strength? Um, yeah, there was, I had a, a friend, uh, Victor Hassin. He was, a, he was an attorney from New York who um, he was doing time. Uh, he was doing life without parole. And he was a very smart guy. He, he, he liked to write. And I remember sitting down with him one day um, and he said, you know, men our age are running countries. And I remember him saying that to me. I mean, he, he, he was a very mature person. He was, he was, he was very much about the community. Uh, he was a very much about his Jewish community, but he was very much about improving our own community as a prison. If he can make improvements, you know, whether paint the place or, or clean up the place or whatever it would, um, he was about that. And it, it kind of rubbed off on me. And I said, this is my community. You know, I don't want to be here forever, but if I'm going to be here, you know, I'll, I want to see it clean. I want to see it organized. But when he told me, he said, men our age, and I was probably in, I was probably 30-ish or so, 30 in my 30s. He said, men our age are running countries. You know, what's, what's our excuse? And I thought, wow, you know, we have a lot of potential. So Victor was a, was a, uh, uh, a big influence. Uh, Warner, uh, Big Moses, he was a big influence. His consistency of getting up in the morning and singing and laughing and carrying on. And, um, you know, I, I thought, man, he has life like me. How come he's smiling and laughing? And I'm kind of, you know, mm, you know, so he, he, Warner made a big influence on my life. And then it was, it was, uh, Larry Titus was a big influence in my life. My friend, Rob Meyer, uh, who was, uh, he, Larry introduced me to Rob. And I was, I just spent a couple of weeks with Rob, uh, a week with Rob a couple of weeks ago in Pennsylvania. And uh, Rob is a close friend. He's, he visited me for 25 years too. And so he's, these guys are like 
big time influences in my life that sometimes when I, you know, feel like giving up or, you know, throwing in a towel and it was a few nights that were, it was tough that I thought about them and I thought, you know, they're, they're fighting a good fight. I need to do the same thing. I don't know these folks, um, but can you share how Greg and Kathy Laurie influenced your book? I'm not sure if I said their names correctly. Yeah, yeah, Greg, yeah, um, Greg Laurie. So he's the pastor of uh, Fellowship Church out there in um, uh, California. So they were doing the revival services, uh, Harvest America. He's part of that, you know, he's the, the leader of Harvest America. They were doing revival services throughout Dallas and at the AT&T Stadium. And the owners of Babes, who I work for, the, the Vineyard family, they own, the, they own their, uh, the Babes restaurants here in Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, they were sponsoring them and hosting them for dinners and stuff like that. So after luncheon, Paul Vineyard said, hey, uh, um, uh, I set it up for you to share your testimony with Greg and Lori. And uh, um, so we went, and we, it, was about, it, was about, it was about 15, 20 of us. His, his board was in town. And so, we were, so I share my story and, and uh, Greg Lori shakes his head and says, man, you need to write a book. And um, my editor, Darren, Darren Shaw, who is my editor, he was in town too. We were just, we finished the book. We were, we were trying to find someone to write the forward. And my, my uh, editor, Darren says, well, we did. And Greg and Lori looked up and said, oh, what's it called? And we didn't have a title for it. And so uh, he, it, we all kind of giggled and laughed because I had a title. Nobody liked the title that I had. And so I, okay, let that go. And so the Greg, Greg, uh, Greg's wife, Lori, said um or kathy i'm sorry kathy laurie greg and kathy laurie uh, kathy said uh unshackled that's what they said to you in the courtroom unshackled unshackle that man release him from shame he said that's what they said that was the part that stood out to her and and we all looked at each other like okay so that's that's where the title came from um and then of course uh we asked if he would write a ford for the book and and he said, send me, send it to me. I'll write the forward. So um, praise God for that, that opportunity. You know, they, they were in town for four days and to have an opportunity to have them as an audience, I would say, you know, to, to be in front of them and, they're, and they're, they're so busy and they're doing such great work with revivals across the country that I had an opportunity to meet them. And it just, you know, like Paul Vineyard said, along the way, he said, you know, at the end, he said, you know, as we went through this whole journey of writing a book, we didn't really know what to do, but God provided along the way, everything we needed, God provided. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. So you've talked a lot about the importance of relationships. And I know you shared a lot about this in your um, message this past weekend. So how do you foster your relationship both with God and with uh, God's people? Uh, well, with, with the Lord, I mean, there's, there's no substitute uh, for prayer and reading the Bible. Uh, we can read all the books about the Bible. We can read books written by people, but to read the word of God itself in the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible uh, is so essential and um, I always say start at chapter one and read through a book. You know, don't just peel the book open and open up. You, you could do it on your spare time, but if you're going to have a devotion with the Lord, you know, start in the beginning. Um, for me, that means sitting at the table first thing in the morning, you know, before I, before I get on the phone, before I open it, you know, turn the TV on, before I do anything, go to work, I spend time in the Word. And so I sit at my table over here. Uh, with a cup of coffee, my, open my Bible, and I have a pen and a paper next to my Bible. And as I'm reading the Bible, I'm making notes, uh, something that I've read in the Bible. But I also, um, I spend time in prayer. You know, I, I spend time in praise and worship, and it may not be everybody's way, but I worship the Lord. I, I go through his names. There's something that works for me. That's been, it's been, um, my habit for the last couple of years 
that I spend time going through his names and that he's my provider. He's my healer. He's my protector. You know, he's my shepherd in, and he's my peace. And so I go through those and then I, I turn to praying for, you know, my brothers and sisters in the prison. I pray for my boss. I pray for the work. I pray for opportunities. I pray for our president. And uh, sometimes I have a list. Sometimes I don't. And sometimes I allow just the Holy Spirit to put people on my heart. Uh, and I, I just spend time in prayer. Uh, again, I keep a, what's important for me is keeping a, a notebook. I'm not a journal, a journal guy, but I'll keep a, a notebook and I'll got some notes down or some scriptures. And sometimes in all that, God wants me to memorize a verse. And I'll realize maybe a couple of days later, that's why I needed that verse because of the situation that, that has risen a couple of days later that that verse is now in my heart that I might not sin against the Lord. So um, the word and prayer, and I think everybody has to develop something um, of their own and, and spend quiet time uh, with the Lord. Thank you. Yep. So this question is about um, having visitors in prison. You talked about having um, Pastor Larry and others who were really supportive of you during that time. So what did that, what did that uh, really mean for you to have visitors? And would you recommend, or do you recommend that folks visit um, those who are in prison to build those relationships? Uh, I recommend if you, if God's put it on your part, part your if God's put it upon your heart to be in prison ministry, I would consider that uh, um, probably most important one-on-ones with people. Uh, you can go in and do Bible studies and that's fine. Um, but to, to call someone out on the visit, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it really makes the relationship uh, one-on-one and, or, or, you know, we might have a couple of people at a time, but uh, I would recommend um, letters, letters. At first, you know, uh, getting to know someone and then moving toward uh, visitations, uh, you get to know someone face to face. Uh, what, it does, what it did for me was it connected me to the outside, but it also, it made me feel worthy of their time, you know, and it just, it, it gave me value. And I said, the, you know, Larry's and the Rob Myers and my mom and my sister when they came to visit me and other friends that would come to visit me. I, I, you know, I, it, it felt valuable. Um, and being in prison is a place where it can really demean you. You, you can get caught up in, Hey, I, I'm a, I'm a no good, rotten, dirty, rotten prison convict. And if, if you allow that attitude, that mentality, it just destroys you. So it was, it was good to have someone face to face, uh, voice to voice. Uh, and I would say if, if God's put that on your heart to pursue, uh, a visitation. Absolutely. So can you tell us more about your ministry now? What do you, um, besides writing your book, because I know you're almost finished writing a second book. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, be... I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm <laughs> done right now. We're done. We're, we're, we're trying to, uh, there's a couple of things we have to do. A couple, you know, uh, we got to get photos and endorsements and and uh afford but we're it's almost it's it's close um so my ministry today so i i ever since i've been released i i knew i i love i love evangelizing i love walking up to people strangers and i i just kind of like doing that and say hey do you know jesus you know they look at me so i um i was always uh testifying of god's grace whether it's a few words or many and I was, I was asked to um, share my testimony, which I had been doing uh, for a year at a restaurant. And so a friend of mine, Chris, who I partner with now, Chris Bear, uh, and he said, hey, you want to share your testimony at a restaurant? I said, yeah. So I do. I go and share my testimony. I meet the owners. And Chris gives an altar call to the workers, about 40 workers. Uh, there was a couple out, you know, other uh, business owners that were invited for the breakfast testimony. And uh, I met the owner, you know, and he said, hey, he says, I have all these restaurants. I, I would like to hire you as a chaplain to cover the rest of the restaurant. I said, let me pray about it. Yes, you know, it was like, <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready to go. So 
what it, how it works is I really do. And I don't want to like, um, you know, getting ready in the morning and prepared spiritually will prepare you for the day. So I do. And when I, so I have responsibility of, of visiting 10 locations around the Dallas Fort Worth area, 10 different restaurant, babes restaurant in different locations, Garland, Arlington, you know, Cedar Hill, uh, Granberry. And, I, and I'll, every day I'm in one of those restaurants and I go in during the working hours and I greet the managers. Um, I've already built some relationships. The, the advantage I have is they've heard my testimony. Uh, I've, I've spoken to all their employees and they know my story in, in groups. You know, we do a Saturday morning every year, Saturday morning, we do a, um, a testimony. The owners pay the workers to come and for an hour, you know, I have their attention. And so they have the advantage of knowing the good, the bad, everything about me and they're, and to be vulnerable, they're, they're more vulnerable too. And they're willing to share and open up. And so I go in and, and I just hang out in the restaurant. I hang at a table. I hang out at a wall. And I, how you doing today? You know, how's your mom? How's your dad? You know, how's it going? How's your relationship with your boyfriend? You, you know, uh, you know, those things that they've already shared with me, I'll start asking them questions. And uh, a lot of times they'll come up and say, hey, would you pray for me? And we'll pray right there. And I remember one of the first times I, I said, yeah, let's pray. And I prayed right there and the server uh, she looked, she looked at, she got done. It's a quick, you know, 15 second prayer. She, her eyes are like this and she looking at me like, and I said, what? And she goes, I didn't think you're going to pray right here. <laughs> you know? And I was like, well, this, I will forget if I don't pray right now, I'll forget. So, uh, sometimes it's conversations, sometimes it's prayer. Uh, occasionally we can share some scriptures with them. Uh, there's nothing formal and it's just a lot of building relationships and I'm, I'm there throughout the day, sometimes in the evening. Uh, it depends how much, you know, they're, they're talking, how much they're communicating with me. And, and uh, I, I visit about twice, three times a month. So it's, uh, and, and they're very receptive. People are very receptive um, in, in what I do. So I'm just available. I'm a resource. I tell them I'm a resource for you. Uh, I am a Christian. We are a Christian-owned company. And uh, the owners felt that, it was important that they have some resources for you. We have other resources. Uh, there's a lot of other resources, but I'm, I'm one of them for, for, the, for the welfare of our, of our, our company employees. So it's, it's amazing. Uh, there's never a day that I don't walk in that somebody, I'm really, that someone doesn't ask me to pray for them. Um, hey, you know, sometimes I'll say, hey, Gene, when you go to church Sunday, will you pray for me? <laughs> I'm like, well, I, how about I pray right now? <laughs> let's, 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 you know, so sometimes they don't have any idea. I, I met, I met two young, two young ladies. They were 18 and 19. Um, and they asked, I, I was talking to them and they said, well, I like, I like church. I like music, but I don't, I don't like the Bible. And I'm like, you don't like the Bible? No, I don't really like the Bible. I said, well, then you, you don't, you have a problem with God then because God wrote the Bible. And he said, really? He said, he, they, they said, is, is that the book where the guy got swallowed by a big fish? And I said, well, yeah. I said, okay, we're on to something, you know? And I realized <laughs> this, 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 these two young ladies, they were sisters, 18 and 19, 17, 18, that they never read the Bible. And I was like, so you never read the Bible? They said, no, we never read the Bible. And so it, sometimes it's, it's, it's that raw you know, and uh, to spend time with them. And I, you know, my, my thing is, I want to let you know that God loves you and God cares about you and you're right in God's will today. Being here is in God's will and their eyes get big and their smile. I said it yesterday to two, two new hires and I said, I just want to know God loves you and you're right in God's will working for us today. Tomorrow, we'll figure out tomorrow, but today you're in God's will. And their eyes and they smile like, wow. So it's, it's, it's like I said, I think I have the best job ever. You know? <laughs> it's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I just want to be mindful of the time. There are a couple more questions, but I'm just going to take one more okay. um, for you. And um, this is the question. Based on your comment, God is in the process 
as much as in the destination, what can you share about living in the moment, not in the past or in the future? Uh, yeah, the moment is even now. Um, you know, I, I know that in the future, I'm, I may not be in Fort Worth. Uh, I may not be a pastor of, of Babe's Chicken Dinner House. Uh, but so the, the now, right now, today, this Zoom meeting is the now. Um, once I get off this, there's things I have to do, clean the house and get ready for tomorrow, whatever, uh, fix a meal. You know, we're, God is in the now and my relationships around me are as they're, they're important, you know, phone calls and those things living in and now is, is if, if you cannot do that, it, it's a, it's a bad spot to be in because you're either, you're either living in the past or you're, you're, you're hoping too much for the future. I, when I was in prison, I, I dreamed of, you know, getting out. Uh, I thought about it. Um, I wondered, but I, I never stayed out, kind of never stayed out there. I knew that I still was doing time. I still had you know, lock the door at night. I knew I had to get up in the morning and go to eat. I had to do all those things. I still had to minister to the Lord. And um, so the, the now is just about um, doing what God has called you to do today. Um, and for me, doing that here in Dallas, in Fort Worth, Texas, is, is where I'm at today. Um, I have some events coming up in California, Pennsylvania and uh, Florida, uh, but I'm not there yet, so. I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna wrap up our, our time yeah. of Q&A, but I would love to give voice to those who are on, and I wanna encourage you to thank Jean and give honor to God, right? Um, and, and I know uh, Jean is smiling, I, I know that that's, that's your heart's desire. I mean, we wanna thank you for being here and for your story, but we wanna really give honor to God because you are here because of God's work. Um, so I wanna encourage you to please give short statements. There are uh, more than 30 of us on the call and if each of us takes a lot of time, then um, then, then we will uh, we'll stress Jean's schedule a little bit. So we definitely want to make sure that you have an opportunity to talk with him, but just keep in mind that there may be many others who would like to give thanks as well. So um, I encourage you to um, unmute yourself if you want to make a statement um, or give a praise. It's Joe, can I go? Yes. Uh, Jean, I'm sorry. Um, you may have seen my wife walk by in her pajamas by accident. So I apologize. Very quickly, um, when you, I'm not a very patient person. When you talked about getting denied parole in two more years, I just sat there and thought, the God is so good that you could, you could last for two more years and then two more years after that. And just, just want to say thank you so much for your unbelievable patience waiting for God to, to tell you what to do. You're welcome. Amen. Dean, you are a shining light in a very dark world, my friend. Thank you. What's your name? Dick. Dick, thank you so much. Thank you. Praise God. <clears throat> And it's Jean. Vicky. It's Vicky here. Um, Hi, Vicky. And I listened uh, so intently two times to your testimony on Sunday, once by myself, and then that's my husband, Dick, who just spoke. And um, I wrote your words. I've been writing all night here, just uh, capturing your words. And I look forward to reading the book. And I say to you, though, the thing that God needed me to hear, and I thank you for, is to say um, when you said that God's will. Uh, for you. So I'll say, so God's will for me is greater than my will for myself. And I will never forget that you said that. I will hold that in my heart. And I thank you for it. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Hello, Dick. Thank you. Um, I have something that I took away from listening to you too, and I put it on my quote board for my kids to see. <laughs> Stay teachable and correctable, for you will grow. 
Uh, Amazing. Oh my goodness. That's so it's good. So true. It's so true. So that really rang to me and I put it on my quote board for my kids to Dude. see it too. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you <laughs> you're welcome so awesome praise god yes that's awesome that's so incredible um gene i would just like to share with you that we shared your testimony at our um, celebrate recovery group last night that was meeting for the first time since march and um fortunately or unfortunately um it, the crowd was predominantly men and they were quite moved by your testimony and um, there it sparked a lot of uh, conversation and some commitment and uh, confession and we're just so glad that we were able to share it with them. Oh my goodness that's so awesome God bless those guys. Hey, Gene, it's good to see you again. Hi. Hey, hi. <clears throat> we thank you so much. We're, we're, we're so grateful. Uh, oh, I spoke awesome. with Scott today. He said to say hello and thank you as well. You're welcome. You are so welcome. Yeah, my pleasure. Any final thoughts? From me? Oh. No, I, I, oh, oh, I, saw, okay. I saw one person. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Jean, I wanted to thank you so much for your testimony today and also on, on Sunday. And um, I, I've been visiting uh, someone in prison for 16 plus years now. My husband has also joined me. And um, we did, we, uh, he, we read the Bible together and we discuss that. I, I just hope that um, the passion that you have, um, I look forward to the day when he has the same passion that you have um, towards the Lord and, um, and it just consumes him, just takes yeah. him over just like the Lord did for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Praise God, yeah. Thank you for visiting them too. Thank you so much. Spending time, yeah. It's, Gene, I um, wanted to thank you for um, your uh, your Pauline courage. You 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 remind me of the Apostle Paul in so many ways, and your willingness to uh, to testify so freely. That's what the world needs. They need more courage more conviction to, to talk about Jesus just flatly and, and, and vividly and bluntly. So I thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys. Yeah. Jean, I just want to uh, remind folks that you are going to be visiting with our Saturday morning men's Bible study on October 31st. That was Pastor Dan who just spoke and he leads that discussion. Um, some, of the, some of the participants in that study are on right now and we're just really looking forward to another conversation with you where you can give uh, continued encouragement for those who are doing some of the very things that you were talking about uh, gathering together as men to study the word and to hold each other accountable and to love one another through every day of life here on earth until we get to heaven right yeah. um, and so I know they will be absolutely blessed by that conversation and the witness that you bring to them we have been so blessed by the witness you brought to us tonight. Um, so I'd love the opportunity to pray for you. And then I would love to ask you if you would pray for us, whatever God puts on your heart. Now, I know I'm asking you that and I didn't tell you ahead of time. So I'm going to go first to give, your, to give you a chance to, uh, to listen and, and connect your ears to a God's voice. But I'm going to close us with a prayer and then ask you also to leave us with a blessing as well. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's pray family. 
God, we thank you so much for creating this opportunity for us. We thank you for uh, nudging us and motivating us to log on tonight, to listen well to the things that you are saying to us through this, your servant, G. McGuire. We praise you so much for his heart, which is open to you, for his ears, which are readily listening for your voice, that he might do your will in this world and represent you well as the light that you are. We thank you for your work in him and for the evidence of transformation through Jesus Christ that he gives to us. We thank you for the fruitfulness of his ministry and, and for the many connections and relationships which he is building right now so that like him, others might come to know what real and abundant life through Jesus Christ looks like. We talk often about what it looks like to reach for eternal life and yet abundant life is available to us right now through Jesus Christ and for his witness we say thank you for his life we say thank you and for his ministry we say thank you and bless him over and over and over in Jesus name amen father I thank you for Jesus and in the work that Jesus has done on the cross through the grave and now sits at heaven at your right hand, Lord. Um, I pray everything that Jesus has accomplished be released through the power of the Holy Spirit in the Hopewell United Methodist Church. And not the building, but in the people, Lord. I pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit that sets captives free would invade every congregant from, from Pastor Amy through the newest congregant, the newest visitor that comes in. Um, or it begins to connect online. Lord, I pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit would, would, would be the mark of, of their church, God, the love of God and the power of God would mark this church in Hopewell um, and transform lives. I pray that they would draw sinners. They would draw the lost. They would draw the hurting, the brokenhearted. God, I pray that they be drawn to the love of God that flows from this church. I pray, God, that you would um, not expand them for the expansion's sake, but for the kingdom of God to expand through them, Lord. Lord, you, 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 you speak three times in the Bible about the church, but many, many times about the kingdom of God. So, Lord, I pray that the kingdom of God would advance forcefully and powerfully and with, with um, marks of fruitfulness peace and righteousness would flow through this community of believers. I pray that you would keep them healthy and keep them safe and sound. I pray that the things that they need in their life, Lord, would be provided because you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. I pray, Father, that they would see signs, wonders, and miracles. I pray they would see provisions in abundance. Lord, I pray that their church would be strong and mighty in Christ and win souls and change destinies and lives. I pray God give Pastor Amy uh, an incredible um, sense of strength and vision and energy as the leader, as a pastor. And Lord, I pray that you would bring many people alongside of her and help her, such as Jen. And Lord, that they'd all be so anointed and so powerful for your sake. And Lord, I thank you for everybody that was on this this Zoom meeting, I thank you. I bless them. I speak life. I speak joy in their life and speak purpose and release in them, Lord, your sovereign will. I thank you, God. I praise you in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Jean, thank you so much for spending the evening with us. We look forward to reading your first book, and then we will look forward to reading your next one. So Absolutely, thank you so yeah. much for sharing your heart, your story with us. It's been a real blessing. Love you guys. I was, I'm, I'm really uh, so happy to be with you all, really. It was good. Yeah. Good time. Yes. Have a great night. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Too. Thank good you. night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Okay. Bye.